Word. We're, we're in the fifth chapter today of the book of James. And the fifth chapter has a couple of themes. It, it, the theme of um, how to respond um, to the return of Jesus, how to, how to live in light of the fact that Jesus is going to return one day. And the second theme is how to pray for the sick. So last week, we ended the fourth chapter and started the fifth chapter. Verses 1 through 6 in the fifth chapter is one of the illustrations that basically James ends the fourth chapter with. And that, that, that illustration was that there's a way that we should not live in light of the return of Christ. The, there, are, there are a couple of ways, James says, this should not be happening in your life when the Lord returns because it's going to be bad for you. And you shouldn't live your life this way as, and, and as a child of God because it doesn't bring what you want. It, it, it curses you almost. It brings condemnation and you, you lose. You, you're not gaining. You're not walking like the Lord has designed you to walk. And the world is not being altered by the way they see you perform the kingdom of God. You're, you're, actually, you're actually standing in the way of the kingdom rather than opening the doors of the kingdom by the way you act. And he gave the illustration at the end of chapter 4 of the traveling salesperson who basically uh, says, I'm going to go to such and such a city and I'm going to stay there uh, a year and I'm going to buy and sell and I'm going to get goods and gains and, um, and then, I, and then I'll, I'll come back and basically what the Lord is saying is, look, you can't say anything about, about tomorrow because you don't even know if you have a tomorrow. And you certainly can't say, uh, I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to be successful and I'm going to stay this long and then I'm going to come back. And then because what you're doing is you're saying, uh, I can proclaim this. And there's no consideration of God. There's no consideration of the fact that none of us know whether we'll have a tomorrow. None of us know what will happen tomorrow because it's God's purpose. He's in control. He's charged. And so really what he's talking about, he's saying, you know, if you're a blue-collar guy, if you're the kind of guy that goes to work every day and you get paid by the hour and you're paid by somebody else to do work, you know, you need to consider the Lord uh, his direction, his purpose, because that's what matters, not your direction, your purpose, and your thoughts. And then, and then in chapter 5, he says, you, to you rich men who howl and so forth. And what he goes on to describe in the first six verses of chapter 5 is he begins to describe, just like at the end of chapter 4 that talked to the blue-collar person, the, chapter 5 talks to the white-collar guy, the, the executive, the business owner, the person who's in charge. And he talk, talks to them as rich people. And he basically says, you know, if you're a rich person, you can do a lot of things because you can choose to obey God or you can choose to not obey. You can, you can take advantage of those that are working for you. You can be, uh, hold back their wages and what they're supposed to get. And, and what he's describing here is, he, is he's describing basically like the blue-collar guy. He's describing... Um, how you ought not be living in light of the fact that the Lord could be right around the corner. And so you don't live for yourself and you don't live to take advantage of people. Uh, you, you live in order to bring glory to God and all that. And, and so uh, here in verse 7 now of chapter 5, for the next uh, six verses or so, he, he says to us, all right, I told you how you should not be living in light of the return of Jesus. Let me talk to you just a second about how you should be living in, in, in the light of the return of Jesus. Let me ask you first, how many of you believe that Jesus is going to return one day? <laughs> do we all believe that? Yeah, do we all believe that? Praise the Lord. Well, I do believe that. I believe that one day... Just like the Bible talks about, the, the sky is going to split and the horn is going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise first, according to Thessalonians chapter 4. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
I believe that. I mean, Christ is coming. He's not going to touch down on the earth. He, he will ultimately, and we'll get in the book of Revelation the Sunday after Easter, we'll start the book of Revelation. Easter's a couple of Sundays away, uh, first Sunday in April, and then the, right after that, here we go with Revelation. But you'll see a lot of things there. You'll, you'll, you'll get a sense of where we are and all of that. It's just really amazing, honestly. So uh, I encourage you with that. But, but you'll see, you'll see um, what the Lord wants us to know about his return. This, this, this return this time is going to be um, basically like a thief in the night. That's what Matthew says. I, behold, I come as a thief in the night. Uh, when a thief comes in the night, do you know he's come? No, you don't know. You know once you see what he did, you know he was there. But you don't actually see him. You see what he did when he was there. So Jesus is going to come in the clouds, and we're going to, it says the dead in Christ rise first. And you say, why do they go first? I have no real answer other than, uh, they have six feet further to go, you know, so that I mean, I mean, they, you know, I mean, I, I guess that's why I, I would be the only, in other words, the Lord wants us to know you guys who are alive aren't going to get a head start, you know, where you're all going together. So we're going to rise them up first. And then, and then when they get to the, to level with you, then you're all going to rise together and you're all going to meet the Lord in the clouds, in the air. And so shall you ever be with the Lord. In other words, from that point right there, throughout the rest of eternity, you will never be separated from Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't that a great word? <laughs> Isn't that a comforting word? Man, you're not going to ever be separated from him anymore. The glory of his presence, you know, the brightness of his, of his glory will be around us and surround us forever. And that's, man, and, and the Bible tells us, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And it, it, they are comforting words. And so in light of that, now, it's really important, I think, that we see and, and we, you just kind of hold this concept in your heart that here is James. And who is James? Who, which James wrote this book? You remember we talked about him? We, there are four primary Jameses in the Bible that are prominent enough to even be mentioned in the Bible. And, 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 and it's very noticeable that of these four Jameses, there's only one that is, is close enough to the Lord, um, mature enough as a child of God, um, li lived in the right era so that it could be him. In other words, didn't die before the book was even written kind of thing. So there's only one that matches all the scenarios for who it might be, and this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was saved when Jesus resurrected and spoke personally to him. The Bible says that Jesus spoke to his half-brother, James, and once he did this, then James became a believer. That means before Jesus spoke to him, he was not a believer. He was not a Christian, which is easy to understand because if your brother came to you and said, I'm the Messiah, I see you. Are you, you know, or your sister, somebody you were, somebody you were reared with, a, a sibling, came to you and said, hey, I just want you to know I'm the Messiah, you would go, sure you are. Yeah, I know that. You got a God complex, man. I don't pray for you. And, um, and as you became an adult, it'd be difficult you know, for you to, to, to believe that this person that you grew up with in your house and you saw them eat and you saw them work and you saw them play. I mean, it's just like, uh, could it be that this guy is really who he says he is? And James, once he resurrected, it was like, oh my goodness, it has to be. So James believes. And James is one of the first books that were written in the New Testament. I know it's placed toward the end. If we had our Bibles, and we've already discussed what a Bible is, right? You know, it's a book, and it's got paper in it, and pages, and writing on those pages, and, and you have to fan through them like this. I know I'm, I'm talking to our young people because they only have, you know, this, 
and you scroll through it like this or like this, you know, and that, that's their Bible. And they just press the, what they want, like they want, you know, James. They just press James, and it goes right to the book of James. They have no idea where James is in the Bible. If you gave them a Bible and said, find, give me the book of James, it'd take them 15 minutes to find the book of James. <laughs> unless, they went, unless they were unspiritual enough to go to the table of contents where they would, it would be verified that they are not Christians and that they don't know the Lord because they don't know where the book of James is. You know, everybody looking around going, look at them, I don't even know where the book is. What a heathen. <laughs> That's the way we used to be when I was growing up. So we would sit there and look at somebody else's Bible that was near us that was in the book of James. And then we would try to get, like, enough pages to match. Okay, that, there, we're, we got about that many pages. Now. And then we'd hold it close, close to our heart so nobody could see that, you know, we were in First John or we were in Hebrew. <laughs> We were in Hebrews. It wasn't quite James, you know. <laughs> but, and, and then whenever pastor would read, you'd go, yeah, amen, amen. amen. <laughs> but, the, but if you did have your Bible, the book of James would be toward the end. It's Hebrews, James, and then you got the Peters and the Johns, first, second, third, all that, and the book of Revelation. Um, and, and so it, even though it presents itself in, at the end of things, it's actually one of the first books that were written. Because many of those books that are before James were written by a man named, named Paul who was saved on the Damascus Road and became a Christian, who was a Pharisee, a persecutor of Christians, and then the Lord met him on the Damascus Road, knocked him off the back of his donkey and, and, and said, and he looked up and was blinded by the brilliance of that light and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus Christ, who you persecute. And the Lord basically commissioned him right there to go and spread the gospel. And the Apostle Paul wrote most of the books that are in the New Testament. So at the time James was written, there was no books that Paul wrote because Paul wasn't even a Christian yet. There were no letters and there were no gospels. There were, there were only Jews for the most part that, were, that had come to Christ who had believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And James is writing, and this is some of the first things that were written to Christian people, what James is saying. And this is just, to me, miraculous and tremendous because he's establishing the theology of what these people are to believe and how they're supposed to behave as Christians. I mean, this is, you know, you don't, he, he doesn't have like 14 other books that agree with him and say the same thing. I mean, the Holy Spirit speaking through the book of James is talking to a group of people who have not, who don't have any theology, who don't know what they're supposed to believe and how they're supposed to act who came out of Judaism and, and all of the sacrifices and the altar and the blood and the, uh, you know, and covenants and feast days and all that, and you do all these things in order to uh, put off your sins for another year and you got to be careful. I mean, that's what they came out of. And to look at them in the letter he writes to them and say, in light of the return of Jesus, this is what I say to you, is really... A tremendous concept because that tells us that James, one of the first writers to Christians, believes that Jesus is coming again. He believes this right off the bat with no other evidence except the, the, the impression of the Holy Spirit of God. He tells us this, and, and so I want us to see just, just quickly today that that. Chapter 5, these verses, and the last two, are dealing with how we ought to live in light of the return of Jesus, and it surrounds itself by four words, all right? How am I supposed to live in light of the fact that Jesus is coming again? How can I prepare myself for Jesus to come again? How am I supposed to be living when Jesus comes again. Four words. All right, here's the first one. Be patient. In light of the fact that Jesus is coming again, the first encouragement for me is 
be patient. Don't, don't get frustrated by the fact that it may, it may take a long time. Because you know how we are. We're, we're easily frustrated. We're easily annoyed when what we think is going to happen doesn't happen immediately. So let me show you the verse, verse 7 of chapter 5, which is, picks up where we left off last week. Therefore, all right, he told us a bunch of stuff in, in verses 1 through 6 about the rich man and how for the riches and, and don't treat people badly and don't try to uh, live this way and make a living off of cheating them and mistreating them and so forth. And then he comes, he says, therefore, all right, we talked all about how not to live, Therefore, now let's talk about how to live. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. So the first thought and the first concept in how we ought to live would be that we are supposed to be patient. And as Christians, we're to live our life in relation to the coming of the Lord with, with two attitudes in our heart. Now, I wrote this in your notes because when I say this, you're probably going to say, what did he say? <laughs> so here's what I'm going to say. All right, in, in light of the fact that Jesus is coming, there are two concepts that James says we have to be patient about. And as we are patient, this is the way we reflect that patience. Now, now listen to me. All right, the first way is... And it's written in your notes, the purifying urgency of an immediate expectancy. Right. <laughs> I can see that you're underwhelmed by that. Um, but you, you, all right, we are to be patient, and we should live with an expectancy on the inside of us that causes us to act a certain way. It is, the, it is the purifying urgency. What, what does purify mean? To yeah, to cleanse. All right, it's, it, this thought of Jesus returning is a cleansing urgency. In other words, we, 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 we want this to happen very bad. We want this to strictly happen, and we, we're like waiting like you're waiting for a baby to be born. I mean, there's an urgency in this. This is like, come on, man, hurry up here. You know, we got to, we got to, we, we believe something that's going to help us live the right way. And so James is saying that because you believe that Jesus is coming again, it's going to affect the way you live your life. Because if you believe that Jesus could come at any moment, you're going to live a different way. If you tell me that you believe that Jesus could come at any moment and that has no effect on the way you live your life, you are either lying to yourself or lying to me. Because if I believe Jesus could come before I walked out of this sanctuary today, I don't want him to, to, to come and catch me doing something that he would not be proud of. I mean, I wouldn't want to be doing some of the sinful things that I can do and that I might want to do because he will come in the clouds and catch me right in the middle of some of these evil things. And so James says, look, be patient in your waiting and wait with expectation because it's going to happen and, 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 and wait uh, believing that this could happen at any moment and it'll help It'll help cleanse your, cleanse your life. It'll, 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 uh, it, it'll, it'll purify you and help you live better. And then the second thing about that coming at any moment is the encouragement here is to wait expectantly in spite of the reality that it may take a long time for him to come. In other words, he said, be patient because we don't know when it might happen. It could be a long time from now. It's like the old farmer uh, who was approached by the preacher, the old farmer sitting on his front porch, so, and the preacher comes up, and the preacher starts talking to him about things, and finally you get on the uh, subject of the judgment day, and the preacher looks at the old farmer sitting on his porch and says, uh, uh, where, where will you be on the judgment day? And he said, I don't even know what the judgment day is. What are you talking about? He said, well, he said, uh, when is it going to be? You know? 
And the, and the preacher said, well, it could be today, or it could be tomorrow, or it could be 100 years from now. And the old farmer looked at him and said, well, don't, don't tell my wife, because she'll want to go all three days. You, know. <laughs> you guys don't have, you can laugh. Your wife's not going to hit you. <laughs> Your wife's not going to hit you in church. Come on. But that's the concept. The concept of it is that in light of the fact that he is going to return and we don't know when, none of us know when, and we might have to wait our entire lifetime because everybody that has loved the Lord between the time he left here and right now, every generation has believed that they were the last one. I guarantee you that my generation, when we were young people like you guys, we believed that we would not basically grow up to be men and women before Jesus came back. And it's not, that's not unusual because these guys in the Bible, and if you read uh, the letters that Paul wrote, you co come to the real conclusion that the apostle Paul certainly didn't believe he would live to see to, to see old life that before Jesus came back. I think the Holy Spirit puts that thought in our heart so that it can help keep us clean, so we can, you know, have some expectancy and it's going to affect the way we live because when we come back, we don't want the Lord to, um, uh, to really catch us in a sinful lifestyle. So it helps keep us clean. And so uh, be patient is what the Lord said. And then, and then he says, I'm going to give you two illustrations, and both illustrations concern farmers, all right? He said, let me give you two illustrations about how patient and what kind of patience I'm talking about. Look at verse 7. Here it is. Um, this is talking about the farmer and the seed. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Now, what is that talking about? It's talking about, okay, James says, let me show you what I'm talking about on being patient. He said, uh, you're, a lot of you guys are farmers, and I know a lot of you in here are not farmers. You are shrimp pickers and stuff like that. You are, you're not farmers, and you've never lived on a farm. But have you ever planted a seed, whether it's a flower seed or a, or a tomato seed or a watermelon seed or any kind of, you know, have you planted, ever planted a seed? If you have, then you've had an experience that James says your patience has to be like this. Now, now follow it. Like the farmer patiently waits for the seed. So what does the farmer do with the seed? When he gets the seed and it comes time to plant the seed, like there are a lot of guys, there are a lot of farmers that plant on Good Friday, which is the proclamation that Friday before Easter, that that's a good day to plant on. A lot of people plant their crops on Good Friday. My dad, my dad, and I, we grew up planting all of my life. My dad planted religiously by the almanac. If the almanac said this day and this day and this day is good, then that's the days he planted on. And there are things that are called vine days, which mean there are certain days you can plant and you'll have great vines, but you won't have very much fruit on it. I'm serious, and it sounds mystic and ridiculous, but it's true. I'm serious. And it was proven way more than one time to me because I kept calling Dad. I said, Dad, you can't believe that. He said, all right, son, let's just see. And we'd plant six or eight seeds and then wait and plant on days that weren't vine days, the rest of that row. And, you know, and then these right here, all oh, beautiful, lovely vines, strong, virile, dark green, wonderful, great, big old something. And they'll have about two little peas on them or two, four or five butter beans on them. Man, the other little scraggly-looking little things down here be like 150 butter beans on this little bunch down here. Yeah, but, but the point is, the point is that when the farmer plants the seed, the farmer does so by faith. No farmer has to ever gamble down at the casinos because their whole life is a gamble. When they put that seed in the ground, that seed costs them something, that fertilize, that, that tilling of the soil, that preparation, 
If they had to hire somebody to help them, if they had to do it themselves, if they had to buy machinery or rent machinery or whatever. In other words, there's a lot of money that's been spent to bury this stuff. But you're, it, by faith, you do it because you believe it's going to come up and it's going to give you more than you planted. So you are planting this thing by faith. Do farmers ever plant a seed ex not expecting it to come up? Well, I'm, I'm going to plant this stuff even though I know it's not coming up. No, you don't. And when a farmer plants a seed, he expects it to come up. So what the analogy in the, in the picture here is that's, that's how we should be with the return of Christ. That even though... We can't see it because once we put it in the ground, it's out of sight. But it's certainly not out of your mind. Because as the farmer puts the seed in the ground, the farmer has certain expectations that the seed is really going to come up. So he puts it in the ground, and it's out of sight, but it's not out of mind. And he has this expectancy for this thing to sprout and come up out of the ground, even though he doesn't know when this is going to happen. It happens based on how much moisture is in the ground, how warm the ground is, how much access to the, to the warmth and the moistness the seed has, what kind of seed it is. Some seeds pop up quicker than other seeds. There are a lot of variables in, in when is this thing coming up? And so the farmer puts it in the ground with complete faith that it is going to come up, walks away from it with an expectancy that he can come out here in some time in the future and there's going to be little sprouts coming up so that he can have a crop. But he doesn't go out there every day and go, man, is that thing coming up? I don't think that thing's coming up. And if he goes out there and he rakes around on it and he fidgets with it and he, and he tries to encourage it to do, he's probably going to dislodge it and, it and it probably is not going to come up. Uh, if it does, it might be stunning and because he's fooled with the thing and you just got to leave it alone. You got to put it in the ground and leave it alone. Like, forget it because that's, you know, it. So he, he, James is saying our expectancy of the return of Christ has to be like that. It has to be like the farmer waiting on a seed to come up. And so even though you put it in the ground and you expect it, you're not out there fidgeting because you have faith enough to believe, really believe that that seed is going to come up. That's what he says. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. And here comes the, here comes the second uh, explanation of the farmer. The farmer and the seasons waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. Now, I know when I read that early and latter rain that some of you who are mature Christians and have been through lots of Bible study, you've heard those terms former and latter rain a lot of times, right? I'm talking about if you've been in Bible studies. Because almost everybody who talks about end times talks about the former rain and the latter rain. Because it's been concluded by Bible speaking people and teachers that, that the terms former rain and latter rain have a deeper meaning than just water raining down on the earth. It represents the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit has been given at Pentecost. That's the former rain. And then at the end of times, the Holy Spirit will be given again like that. This comes from the book of Joel, by the way. And, and Hosea has a little bit to say about it too. And, and, and that the Holy Spirit will fall like it did on the day of Pentecost. So that's the former rain, and then Pentecost is the latter rain. So G Jesus has already done this former rain thing at, the, at Pentecost, you know, in the upper room when the disciples got full of God and cloven tongues of fire. They came down speaking stuff they didn't know, and everybody said they're drunk, and Peter said they're not drunk. Uh, they're talking about Jesus, and 3,000 people got saved listening to Peter preach on the steps there. You know, as that happened, that was the day of Pentecost. Then... They're going to, that's going to happen at the end of times. That's the latter rain. Now, I'm going to tell you, this has nothing to do with that. I just told you that so you would know if you hear those words and it kind of sparks your interest, like, whoo, okay, we're getting something mystic here. All right, praise God. 
we to get into some magic stuff here. No, no, we're not. No, we're not. You know why? Because those words have nothing to do with that. Those words, the words that are used for rain here is the word that is used to, to signify water. I mean, real water that just falls on something. And what that is, it is an illustration, but it's an illustration of what happens every year in Israel. In Israel, it rains in between, between August, really October and December, actually. That is called the early rain. It's the fall rain. I know this seems backwards, but this is the way it's talked about. I didn't write the rules, okay? There's a rain between October and December which moistens the ground and gets it ready for the planting of the seed because they plant uh, in August. A lot of times they plant barley and they plant wheat. I mean, and it grows. It, it gets ready. Then it sprouts in the springtime. And so you have to have it in the ground. That's the former rain. Then the latter rain happens in the spring around planting time. For a lot of other crops like butter beans and peas and corn and spinach and cabbage and blah, 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 tomatoes and all that. But, but whether you know that or not, I just, I, that information is just, you know, super, superfluous. Um, but what he's talking about clearly are seasons. I mean, he's talking about there is a season. There's a former rain and a latter rain. And so he's talking about the fact that in our lives, there are seasons of time. What are seasons to a Christian? They are timings of God's work. Times when he works one way. Time when he chooses maybe to work another way, or he veers to this way. I mean, there are timings, there are workings, there are seasons. How many of you have ever felt a season of God in your life? Huh? Well, there are times where you felt very close, right? I mean, it seems like God just puts his arm around you, and you're just hugged up to him, and, and you're nestled and all of that, and you feel very close to God and wonderfully warm and all of that. And then, lo and behold, two weeks later, you're looking around going, where's God? Because you've marched into another season. And whereas there were certain things true about this season, now it seems like this next season, it's not like that anymore. Ecclesiastes, by the way, another book in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Solomon wrote it. Ecclesiastes says there is a, there is a season for everything. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to uh, plant and a time to reap, a time to uh, tear down and a time to build up. Yeah, he says there's a season for everything under God's heaven. And so James is just saying that now the farmer has seasons in his life and, and, he, and he says it waiting patiently until he receives the season of God, the former and the, and the, and the latter rains that, that Christ is coming one day. So just like Jesus, now listen to this, so just like Jesus in John 4, Jesus and the disciples were looking out at a big harvest field out there. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, now, don't say in three or four months there's going to be a harvest. Lift up your eyes to the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. In other words, Jesus said that we can miss the timing of God if we don't pay attention to this. So the farmer waiting the Lord is trying to get us to understand that there is a season in which Christ is going to return and that we need to keep our eyes open so we don't miss it because this world has been planted, it's been cultivated, and whenever there's a, there has been a struggle between righteousness and unrighteousness and when, the, and when the cup of God's judgment is full, at some point right there, Jesus is going to come again. So according to that, verse 8, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So he's just saying don't miss it. Don't, 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 be, 
Don't, don't be fretting about it and don't be worried about it and don't be nervous about it. Be expectant. Be, even though you don't know what it is, don't lose hope. Keep it deep in your heart. Stay fired up about it because it's coming. Just like a farmer goes out and plants a seed, man, that crop's coming. Yeah, and I believe it. And by faith, I put it in the ground. By faith, I water it. By faith, I see it. And be, be expectant that way. Here's the second word. Be quiet. Mm. Boy, that's hard to do, isn't it? <laughs> be quiet. All right, remember now what we're doing. We're, we're, James is saying, in light of the return of Jesus, this is how you, you are to act. All right, now keep it in mind. That's the flow of here. I am to be patient. I'm to believe. I'm to wait patiently. I'm to wait expectantly. And then, secondly, I'm, while I'm waiting, I'm to be quiet. All right, let me show you in the verse. Here's verse 9. Do not murmur. Everybody go, murmur, murmur. Go like that, murmur, murmur, murmur. That's what, that's, uh, that's, that's called an onomatopoetic word. Onomatopoeia. Onomatopoetic word. You know what that means? It means a word that sounds like what it means. Like murmur. You know, that's what, that's what murmur is. <laughs> it sounds like what it is. Murmur. In other words, when you say those soft things like, hey, did you hear? I know it's not true, but we need to pray for some murmur. The old English word, the old King James word that was in the original, this is, this is the new King James Bible, by the way. I know some of you may ask, what Bible do you put up there? That's the new King James. It just leaves out the hither, thithers, and owls and stuff. But it changes a word every once in a while when an old word, you know, is not really used much anymore. And the word, the old word that the King James Bible used was the word grudge. Grudge. Grudge not one another. Grudge and murmur, they're both words that are used <laughs> for don't bellyache. In other words, don't gripe to each other. Don't, 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 don't uh, spend your time um, complaining about the fact that Jesus promised something and it hadn't happened yet. Because James knows and the Spirit of God knows how grouchy and how ill-tempered we can get when we have to wait on things that we believe are going to happen, but, we, but they hadn't happened yet. And whenever I have to wait on things, then it gets really tough for me. And I get grouchy, and I get aggravated, and I get, and I get ill about things, and I have a tendency to begin to speak things and gripe about things. And, and, and the longer I wait, the worse it gets. So he says... You're to be patient and quit grumbling about things. Why should you quit grumbling about the fact that he hasn't returned yet? You should quit grumbling about it because, here, listen, the longer he waits to return, the bigger the harvest can be, right? I mean, what, what we have time now, until Jesus returns, we have time to have a harvest. We have time to go out and plant the seeds of salvation and let people respond to Christ and come to Christ and be saved. And that means that the longer we wait, the, the more people can be influenced by the gospel. And so, you know, go out and plant the seed and, you know, go out and water the crop, go out and hoe the weeds, go out and put fertilizer on the thing, do anything but gripe, grumble, and complain. Because that griping, grumbling, and, 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 and complaining is just simply a battle on the inside. James is saying, look, the battle is not on the inside. The battle is out there. The battle is not in here. The battle's out there. Recognize that your enemy is not sitting beside you. Your enemy is an evil presence trying to hinder the things of God out there. So get off the battlefield and get in the harvest field and, and win people to the Lord while the season is hesitating is that 
be quiet. Don't gripe. Don't grumble. Don't complain. Because unity and harmony attract people, draw people, right? How many of you would be attracted to Freedom River if we had a big old church fuss going on? Would you come? Would you like that? Would you like to, when you walk in that door back there, half of this church be for me and half, the, half of it be against me? I mean, you depend on who you sat by as to how they responded during the message. Well, they looked at me and growled. <laughs> Whether when you say my name, you had to either duck or pucker, one of the two. No, you wouldn't feel comfortable with that at all. As a matter of fact, that would chase you away. You would, that would repel you, right? So what he's saying here is if you murmur and gripe against each other and complain, you create an atmosphere where when people come into it, they don't sense the presence of God. They sense division and strife, and it runs them away from the things of God rather than drawing them to the things of God. How many of you come to Freedom River because you sense that there is a unity here? That there's a harmony here, right? I mean, you sense that we don't have any big people and little people. You sense that we don't have any cliques. That there's not a favorite bunch of people that run everything and then there's others. It's, I mean, that it's just a sense of unity here. And you love that and it draws you and you say, man, I feel warm and welcome there. I feel like, gosh, man, they, they care about me and I can be a part of a people that are not judgmental and harsh and all that. And, and you see what that does, that sets up an environment in which we can bring people to that actually encourages them to give their heart to the Lord because we know Jesus is coming and they need to be ready because if they're not ready when he returns, they're going to be left behind. And if they're left behind, what are they left behind to? The greatest time of tribulation this world's ever seen. So our compassion for people says, be quiet, be patient and be quiet. Now, I have two other things, and I'm not going to be able to preach both of them because I've already worn you out. Um, let, me, let me just do these two next week, all right? There are two more, two more words that, that are there how, that we're to do, but I, I think that's enough for you today. Uh, just bow your head with me one second. Let me, let me just kind of bring this down, just bring it in where it is. Uh, James, writing to us, in the last days, and I know, I know most of you would have to believe these are the last days, because you, you see what's going on around us. I know you do. You'd have to. And, and let me just say, as a minister of the gospel and as somebody who's preached the word of God for 43 years, now that doesn't mean I know everything. Believe me, there are plenty of things I don't know. But I'm, I'm really not bothered by what I don't know. I'm really bothered by what I do know. That, that's the things that upset me in the word, what I do know. And what I do know after all these years is that Jesus is coming again, and it could be at any moment. And that right now, all of the prophetic information in the Bible that the Bible says will happen before the Lord returns. It has or is happening right now. And that there are no unfulfilled prophecies left that have to happen before Jesus comes back again. I know I, uh, people back before Israel became a nation, they would preach the Lord's coming, Lord's coming, Lord's coming. And there was no way he was going to come because Israel was not back in the land. And one of the major prophecies was Israel had to be back in their land. Well, they've been back since May 14th, 1948. That's when they became a nation again, flew the flag of Israel again. Well, that fulfilled that prophecy. And there are many others like that, and they've all been fulfilled just like that. And it could be at any moment. So I, 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 I'm saying be ready. That's what I'm saying. Be ready. But I think the main thing, the main reason why I would encourage you today to look at your own heart and examine your own self is not because I think he could return in the next minute or that you would die tonight 
the odds are you're going you're gonna to wake up in the morning and this old earth is still going to be here. That's the odds. The odds are. So I don't ask you to consider because I think you're going to be gone in a second or two. I ask you because I believe you're going to wake up. And I'm telling you to live in this world that we're in right now, you need the Lord more than ever. You need Christ in your life. Because this, this place is hard. It's crazy. And this, let me tell you something else. It's going to get worse than this. It's, it's quickly running toward a cliff for Christians. I, I, I know I'll be talking a lot more about this, but, but believe me, believe me, it's going to get tough. I mean, it's going to get tight. It's going to be really, really something. I mean, I, you, you can already see it. I know you can. You have to. You have to see how bad and tight things are becoming for Christians. It's a persecution falling on Christians everywhere throughout this whole world like we've never seen it before. And it's going to get worse. So be ready, James says. Be patient, be quiet, because the Lord's going to return again. Why don't you just stand to your feet?